Let's do it. Alrighty. Here we go. My name is Marty Fox from White Fox. Now, here's the deal. Welcome to another episode of With the Fox. I'm Shira Taft. I'm joined, of course, by Marty Fox. And we're very lucky today to be joined by a man. I don't think it's an understatement to say who's changed the face of Aussie TV over the last 20 odd years. Julian Cress, creator of The Block. It's so nice to have you with us. Of course, there's a relationship between, between you and Marty, which we'll dive into. But what a, what a privilege it is to have you with us chatting about all things The Block and life. Thanks very much. Glad to be here. Thanks for being here as well. Very, very cool to have you. Well, we, we, we will talk about this relationship between the two of you, but I thought it would be remiss of us not to sort of dive back into the start, the core of this all, because the block's become such an enduring part of, um, you know, Australian television history. It's, it's just ever present. We know of it. Everyone talks about it. Um, I know it wasn't necessarily a linear journey. There was a few bumps along the way and we, we're heading into season 20, which is astonishing for any TV show, not just in Australia, but in the world to have 20 seasons. Can you, can you take us back to the start? Like you obviously sat in front of some network executives and pitched an idea. Can you give us a bit of an insight into just where this all began? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been 22 years now, uh, since we first pitched the idea. How old were you when you pitched it? 30, 30 something. I, had, I remember I had hair <laughs> and it wasn't great. It wasn't great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was the turn of the century, really, you know, so uh, the beginning of the 2000s, um, everything shifted in television um, with the arrival of two big reality shows, um, Big Brother and Survivor. And I think it was 2001. And I loved, you know, like they were just, it was just something completely different. And my background was journalism. So, you know, I was at 60 minutes for a long time. I'd spent a lot of time working with real people. I'd never, you know, wasn't, didn't work in drama. I worked in reality, you know, pure reality, 60 minutes. You investigate, that's like the, yeah, getting that's the right. surface. But it's about, it's about building relationships with real people and, and, and getting real people to tell their stories. And so that's kind of my background anyway. What I loved about those two shows was that it was real people, you know, on television. Um, prior to that, you know, a lot of those shows in the nineties were what we call magazine television, you know, where you'd have expert designers or expert builders, you know, showing people how to expertly build something, you know. And what were those shows at the time? So it was Our House and uh, Location Location. And Better Hoves and Gardens and Gardens and Burke's Backyard. Backyard Blitz. Backyard Blitz with Scotty Cam as a very young man <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And so, so it was really with Survivor and Big Brother and, you know, us looking at those shows with my uh, creative partner, David Barber, um, we'd sort of come together and decided we wanted to make our own show for television. We'd, we'd worked on others, but we wanted to make our own. And I think. It was, you know, watching Big Brother and watching people sit around in a TV set of a house and do not a lot. Um, you know, they get prodded by producers to do things, but, um, but they basically, you, you're watching people sitting around doing nothing, right? And, and so our feeling was, well, what if they had to renovate the house that they were in? You know, what if, what if those people, those real people actually had a task, had a challenge? So that seems obvious now, but back then no one had ever done that before. And so that's where kind of where the block idea was born. And when did that light bulb moment occur? Where do you remember it vividly? Yeah, it was, uh, around May of 2002 and Dave Barber and I would, um, uh, set aside, uh, a couple of hours every sort of, uh, Wednesday, um, our quieter day of the week. And we would, uh, grab a coffee and we would lock the door and we would sit in our office and we would just brainstorm ideas for television shows for maybe an hour or two. And it's so cool. And we were probably about four weeks into those Wednesday sessions where we came up with the idea for the block. So it was, it was pretty, pretty quick. Was it called the block? It was called Blockbuster. Um, but, uh, Channel 9's lawyers were pretty quick to <laughs> say that, uh, that probably wouldn't. Well, that's so it was still a video rental company. It, it was actually a very big business. Yeah, yeah. Um, with lots of lawyers. So yeah. So we decided to steer away from that. Um, and, and make the block. And of course it was a big gamble for channel nine to do it because it was the only show that had been pitched to them ever. 
that could not be piloted, um, mm. which was part of our strategy because we'd made pilots for shows, but they didn't get picked up. They just got put in a drawer and never seen again. They were, they were on VHS tapes. Um, but uh, the block was a show you couldn't pilot because you had to buy a block of apartments to make it. So then how did you convince Channel 9 to come to the party when you don't have a pilot? It obviously requires money yes. up front. Yes. What was, so you've got the idea. Mm -hmm. Obviously, super grandiose yep. to think that you could just pitch it. You were in your early 30s. Yeah. Can we say about this? So just really, at this time, Carrie Pack is still around. He's Carrie Pack is the owner of the network. He's the, do, he's the doyen. Like, you, you've got to convince this guy. He's, just, he's the big dog. So, so what did you do? Like, on that Wednesday, when it all just, like, came to fruition, yeah. the idea, Yeah. how did you take it to Kerry? Or was it someone before Kerry? Yeah. So we pitched the idea. We, we had it on the Wednesday. We wrote it on the Thursday. We spent the weekend um, creating a, a visual document, which was bit on A3. It was A1 maybe. It was, it was this size. And that we did that because we also thought that when we pitched it, um, they wouldn't be able to put it in a filing cabinet. Um, As it's so smart. <laughs> it's so smart. I got, Just being different. And we don't put it in the drawer. That's right. Yeah. And uh, uh, interestingly, that document sat on that guy's desk. Every time I saw him for the next couple of years, it was still on his desk because he couldn't put it anywhere. <laughs> so good. Uh, but I think he also grew to love it. His name was Peter Macon. He was the head of news and reality. Reality was a brand new thing at the time. And so they didn't know who to... Mm which executive to give it to. So they gave it to Peter because he was head of news and current affairs. So you probably knew him from your 60s. I knew him well from those days. Um, but the, what, what the idea required to get across the line was Kahunas really. Um, and they came in the form of, uh, David Gingell, who had just been appointed to be the, uh, two IC of the network. So he was a young man who was, you know, had built up a surf shop business previously. Um, but you know, he was the son of Bruce Gensel, uh, who was the first man on Australian television. So he had the television running through his veins, um, and godson of Kerry Packer. And so Kerry put him in to become, to, to eventually become the CEO. Um, so he put him in as the deputy and Ginge heard this idea. We pitched Peter Macon on the Monday. He took it straight upstairs to Ginge. Ginge then got on the phone with Kerry Packer. Uh, Kerry hated it, thought it was a terrible idea for a show, really hated it. And I'm told that Ginge said something along the lines of, well, you gave me this job, mate. I'm back in it. Get out of my way. I'm going to do it. Wow. Wow. It's huge. <laughs> and it was, and it cost me millions, right? Cause you had to put up 2 million bucks up front to buy the block. So no pilot, straight to series. Um, so that's, we're forever grateful to him because he, he, you know, he had the balls. And who gave you that tick of approval? Was it a call from Ginge or did you get in front of Kerry? How did that go? It was, it was Ginge making, they, you know, they said, all right, guys, we're making the show. We're doing it. I think it was commissioned within a week of the idea coming to us. And what was that first property? Uh, it was a uh, block of apartments on Roscoe Street in Bondi Beach. Um, we bought it at auction and we bought it. We bought, uh, I mean, it's, it's five minute walk on Bondi oh, Beach. Oh, oh, oh block of four apartments, unrenovated apartments, and we paid 1.950 for the whole. And you handed a check over at the end of the auction. Yeah. So whose signature on that check? We had a blank check from Kerry Packer. Oh. To go to the auction. Signed with his no signature. One, no one knew how much it was going to cost. So we literally had a blank check signed by Kerry Packer. Before, just, before, just taking back one step. So when you get the green light, now it's like, oh my God, we've got to make this show. We've got to sit down. We've got to plan production. And then you have to think where is the best spot to do it? How, how did you come up? Obviously Bondi is an amazing spot. There would have been others on the table, I'm sure. Yeah. The, the key to it was, and, and remains so today, um, that we want the, we always wanted the block to be an aspirational show. So, you know, we want people watching, we want, we want the contestants who are doing the show to feel like they're, they've, they've got the opportunity of a lifetime. And we want the people watching at home to cheer them on because they have the opportunity of a lifetime. Mm. So we always felt like we wanted to, we wanted to buy property that, you know, a lot of our audience, I know most of our audience is families in the suburbs of Australia. You know, they, they, they live in, they live in Penrith and they live in Liverpool and they live in Narrawarren and they live in Hoppers Crossing. All of those suburbs around the country 
um, they're your average Aussie families, you know, and they can't afford to renovate a dream home in Vaucluse or Bondi or Manly or, um, or, or, uh, you know, Brighton or Hampton or Phillip Island in a mm. holiday house, which we're doing this year. Um, so they watch this show because it's aspirational. They're like, how good is it? And how lucky are these people? And what's so interesting about that is you're so right in that it is the average Joe that is absolutely addicted to the block. But then there's also another band of customer and viewer that actually is in these suburbs like your Alba Parks and Middle Parks and Parans and Windsors that are climbing that ladder within the property market, but they may not be able to afford the interior designer or the architect. And they're actually getting their inspiration and ideas from the block because the block's always at the cutting edge of what's happening in the industry. Yeah. And they look at it as, you know, they're free their free interior designer and they're getting these ideas. And what are some of our team members walk in meeting people saying, oh, look, I've done this stone. I've done this tile. This was on the block from this year and that year. And it is so prevalent, particularly in Melbourne. Of course. And I mean, that's why we, that's why we have so many sponsors. I mean, they know, um, and they keep coming back year after year, the Beaumont tiles, Reese, plumbing, you know, they, all these, all these great sponsors that we have, Mitre 10 and so on. Um, they, they keep coming back year after year because they get traffic. People walk into the store when the show's on the air, people walk into the store and say, I just watched a, this couple bathroom week last night and I want those tiles and, um, and I want to do my own bathroom, maybe not in a week, but they want to make their own bathroom. Mm. And yeah, we don't, we don't make the show, you know, with the belief that we're trying to inspire people to go and buy a house in Hampton and not, you know, and, and renovate it. Mm. We make the show, um, so that people are inspired to make over their own bathroom in their own home. Um, maybe, you know, um, think about adding a Kinsman kitchen reno, you know, uh, cause they see these kitchens on the block and they're like, wow. Um, now that, you know, the kitchens that we do may be bigger than what they can do at home, but it doesn't mean that they can't use the same stone or right. same cabinets and really create something beautiful for themselves and their family. And I feel it's such an addicted audience because it's not just entertainment. Like if we go back to say Big Brother, that's entertainment. Whereas I find that this is valuetainment. Every episode, there is value to be taken and combining it with the drama that comes with the block and the pressure and the relationships under, you know, such scrutiny. I mean, there's cameras everywhere. They can't escape. Yeah. That's the magic is in the valuetainment of the show. Yeah. I know that there's huge takeout. I mean, I'm, you know, we've seen it time and time and time again. Uh, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, um, we, at the Block Shop, uh, which is an online store that we started, again, to add value for the audience, you know, to give them an opportunity to actually access the cushions and the artworks and all those sorts of things. Um, we, we had a woman ring us and um, she'd just watched an episode where Ronnie and Georgia had done a main bedroom and said, I, I, I really love that bedroom that they did. Um, I, I, I want it, I want it all. And we're like, what do you mean you want it all? She goes, oh no, I'm doing exactly that bedroom. I want everything. I need the, all the cushions, the bed. I want the bed head. I want the paint colors on the walls and the, and the, you know, everything. And she was so happy to be able to replicate that room in her own home down to the color of the throw on the bed. Um, and she just, and, and she sends pictures later. Good on you. You know, it's, it's, it's like the, it, to be honest with you, you're like the original influencer marketing. This is before Instagram, right? And even the yeah. first few seasons, people are watching. It's like, oh, yeah. this makes sense. If you watch someone doing something that you like, you will potentially then in, in, you know, invest in that same thing, which then became obviously now influencer marketing is massive, but yes. you guys are sort of at the forefront of it without probably even knowing that you were. Yeah. Well, the, the HIA. Um, conveniently for us, uh, went and spent a whole lot of money doing a survey about 10, 11 years ago, 2012 that was, uh, which was published in the Fairfax press. Um, and they asked one question, um, and that was, uh, and I think they used Roy Morgan or someone like that. They asked one question and it was, what value does the block TV show add to the renovation market each season? And the number that they got was over $250 million of stuff bought, you know, generated. Mm. 
instigated uh-huh. by the block. And that's 12 years ago. So adjusted for inflation and everything else. It, and, and 20 series in, it took a billions, five or six billion dollars. Yeah. You know, um, at least. And uh, that's something we're really proud of. I mean, we, we see it all the time. You know, we'd, Ford have been a sponsor for a number of years and they, they, our guys drive around in ranges, wild tracks and, and Everests. You know, they've got these two cars that they use. And during the show, when it's on air, Ford see like a 25% increase in interest in those two models alone. And they end up having waiting lists. They just, they can't make enough of them. Because it's the eyes by the audience. Right. Yeah. So, you know, some people think that that's, you know, evil empire, you know, whatever, yeah, yeah. profiting off, you know, whatever. I don't. I mean, I think there are people out there who want to use. They watch this show and they go, that looks like a really good one. Yeah. I'm going to buy one of those. Um, and then they go and get something that they're really happy with. You know, I think it's a win-win. Mm. Can we go from, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot, we could talk for hours to be honest with you. Um, back then, and I was, I'm like you, I was obsessed with Survivor. I didn't watch so much Big Brother personally, but Survivor in particular, Jeff Probst, absolute hero of mine. It still was very different to what it is today in terms of reality television. It was pretty raw. Mm. Um, there probably wasn't what we consider now the storylines that now might take place in, in reality television. Plus, um, we were still talking about five networks, really, old four main um, in Australia. So the eyeballs were enormous. Yeah. Can you take us through? I, I know the first two seasons um, were I mean, breakthrough for the first, second, and then, of course, things changed after the second. Can you take us through that? Because then we can go through the genesis of how you came back and bigger, stronger. Things have changed massively. Um, okay. So... It's a long time ago, yeah, okay. um, but I'll give you, I'll give you a few stats, please. Uh, I think we had a crew of about 10. We now have a crew of, um, 140. Um, the contestants renovated a 73 square meter apartment over 12 weeks. Um, now they're doing living dining rooms that are 73 square meters in one week. The contestants had two weeks to do a room. Then, now they have one. Um, they went to work during the day right. and renovated at night. What's and they cool? got home, you know. Um, so it was a very different. It's fair. Uh, old days. Yeah, you got, got a job at home. Yeah, yeah. 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 And a few cameras. You probably only have a couple of cameras. I mean, sound guy. Yep. We had four cameras and, um, and, and two sound guys and two editors. And, you know, now we've got our post production team 75. So the take us through that first season. Well, but remember, we only made 12 episodes and now we made. Well, I was going to say, it's now strip programs. Yeah. Are different. But so, so it was on once a week then. Um, and now now it's on, you know, five nights a week. Do you remember the opening, you know, when it went to air, what your feelings, how did it go? How was that first season for you and Channel 9? And the oh, uh, we were pretty nervous uh, in the lead up to it going to air. Um, one little tidbit is um, that we were commissioned the network gave us a, a, a time slot, 6.30 Sunday, mm. um, to make a, a half-hour show. Um, and uh, anyway, we delivered. Um, we had the screening of the first episode, uh, and we had the VHS tape, and it said the block at one, and it had 30 scroll in the corner, or whatever. Um, and we put it in and with the executives and King me, Ken and everyone, and Michael Healy, and we watched the first episode, and at the end of it, they went, that was great. Like, that's, that's awesome. We're really happy with it. And we said, oh, that's really great, guys. Just one thing we probably should point out, it's an hour. Oh, they didn't even know this. <laughs> but they only gave you a half an hour slot. Yeah. This would have had to change their whole program. And they had to give us, and this is, so this is 6.30 on a Sunday, 60 minutes kicks in when? 7.30. So they had, they had two shows on Sunday night at 6.30. You had to, I can't remember now, but they had to punt the other one. Oh, that would be insignificant, clearly. <laughs> so, so there's such a, a great theme here, you know, the big A1 pitch deck, the hour behind, you know, them saying you only had half an hour. It's like you've known when to be cheeky. Mm. You've known when to sort of play your cards and back yourself in. Yes. And just go for it. Yes, we're very much alike. Oh, there's no doubt. Absolutely. There's no, there's no doubt this season. We get, we, we'll but then it didn't go, it didn't all go swimmingly because of course, after season two, 
Uh, it, it, it went swimmingly at the beginning. It was the highest rating TV show in the history of Australian television. Yeah. Has it been topped since that? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, those numbers are They're so astral. big that nobody gets them anymore. We did, you know, I think there were 6 million people watching that auction yeah, that's around the country. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, it was staggering. Uh, no one had, can't nowadays it's so spread. Like everyone's watching yeah, so many yeah, there's things. But but back to the yeah, Disney Plus and too many options, you know. It is way there were there were three channels there. And even Foxtel. It wasn't like you could record Foxtel, you had to just watch it if you had it. Only only a small percentage of households had Foxtel. So it was very limited that Oh yeah. Yeah. Um but yeah, you're right. We then had series two in Manly. Um and then the show was actually kind of rested, cancelled. For what reason? The property market, it was, it was perceived that the property market was really turning against uh, everyone and they just weren't sure that a real estate show was the right play going into 2006. Um, but it didn't turn out to be anywhere near as bad uh, as people feared um, and, and then they, they, they would have and tried to make the show again you know, in 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, but unfortunately, um, David and I had then moved to the United States. So we'd, we'd gone over to LA to work and, mm -hmm. um, Nella and they, they couldn't actually find anybody to, who understood how to make the show. Yeah. That was, you had the all well, over we away. So they, they tried, but they couldn't do it. I needed the creator back. Yeah. Oh, creator back. Yeah. Well, it was a big deal. I mean, this was a thing. It was a, it's, to have a show to the rate like that. And cause such a wave in the industry, um, and then for it to kind of be "quote unquote" rested. Firstly, it must have been a shock for you, but then even for the viewing public, they would have been like, "Hang on a sec, we love this." Yeah, right. I mean, it rated really well, even in the second series. So, yeah, they they could have continued. I, I don't think they they wouldn't make that mistake now. No, I think it was probably a bit arrogant at the time. Um, but uh, we eventually, David Gingell, the management of Nine at the time was a bit awry. Um, David Gingell had left. Um, and it, it was him that we were working with in, in the U S and we got really settled in America and really loved living in LA. Um, but David Gingell get then was called by James Packer to come back to Australia and run channel nine again. So he came back into one and took over the network again. And then he called us and said, now I need you guys to go back. And he moved back home. Like, oh, no, really? We're just so happy here. He's like, you got to come and help me. We've got to turn this thing around again. Um, and what was that season? What location? Vaucluse. It's interesting Sydney, Sydney, so like to start it so Sydney centric. Well, we were, we all lived in Sydney. Yeah, you know, right. where, where we're from, it's the market we knew. Um, and we did that and it did well. Um, and then we moved it to Melbourne because the ratings in Melbourne had been really strong and we, we thought it would be nice to do a series in Melbourne and just thank the people of Melbourne for supporting the show. So we brought it down here, um, in 2011, uh, and we're still here. And where was that first season? Richmond. Yeah. Cameron Street. And oh, the terraces. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, cause we actually sold one of those. We've just quite a rich, White Fox has quite a rich history with the block now, obviously now, but even, um, you know, with Jesse having been on it, we sold the Oslo again recently. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That was a good project. Danny. That, yeah, that was great. Great, right? those houses. Yeah. Um, and so was there a change in mindset as you came back and started to regenerate the show and now the world's changed, now there's more network, there's, there's, Je there's Gem, there's Go, there's all these other channels, mm. um, things, are, things are changing. Was there, a, was there a mindset in the production team of, okay, how do we now go to the next level? How do we, you know, future-proof this show? So we, 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 try to, we try to keep a lot of it the same. You know, there's a, there, there's familiarity that I think is important. I mean, obviously we're, we're very lucky because we've got, you know, Scott Cam as a host, you know, and he's just a, an iconic man and a top bloke and everybody loves him. Um, so, you know, we'd never change that, but we also want to make enough changes to the program every year to keep it interesting. The biggest one that we can do, and I think the reason why it's probably still fresh for the audience is that we change the location, you know, MasterChef can't, uh, the voice doesn't change its location. It's in the same bloody set every time. Right. And so is MasterChef. So 
you know, they have to just rely on casting of the characters. Um, but we get to cast a location first as well. And because we can make it so different every year, um, that becomes a really promotable element and something that, that makes our fans go, oh, wow, holiday houses on an island. That's cool. I'll check that out. You know, so they, they, and when they get there, Scotty Kim arrives, they get to meet five new teams of contestants, but the whole backdrop and the whole feel of it is completely different to anything they've ever seen before. It's so true. Every season you're seeing someone and something different, which keeps you so engaged. We did, because, we did a tree change in Gisborne yeah. a couple of years ago. Um, well, this is the first touristy location. This is genuinely a tourist mecca. Yeah. And a resort. I mean, we're, we're in a enclosed it's intriguing, environment. It's it, an intriguing season from the outside. As an outsider, I go, look, this is going to be interesting. There's, there's enough hooks there to be different. What was the castings right? I know that's, that's a huge part of it for you. How much are you across that, Julian, in terms of? Oh, hugely. How many entrants a year? 20, 30,000? Yeah. Tens, tens of thousands every year. I think the record's 45,000 couple. And does someone genuinely sit through each and every one of those? Yeah. Lucky price. No. He's a great man. <laughs> Had dinner with him last night. Yeah. He's, he's, he's not only our casting director, but he's also a series producer on the show. Yeah. So uh, he, it's a full-time job. He goes all year round working on the blog. Uh, the casting process, so the, the filming is three months, um, casting is six. So we actually spend twice as much time choosing the five couples who are going to be on the show as we do filming the show. And then is that just devastating when you put all that time and effort into getting the right people and as we've seen in the past, they throw the towel and walk off and you just think, you don't know what you're walking away from. Uh, no, uh, not devastating. That was hilarious. <laughs> it's just story. Yeah, like, exactly. It That's made, TV, baby. Yeah. It made for a pretty intense couple of days of work. Great promo. Uh, but what a promo. Like, how much do you chase in? promo? Uh, promo just happens. happens for us. We don't, we don't ever do anything for the purpose of it being, you know, a promo. But enough stuff goes down there. You know, that there's always something to promote. It's quite funny when you're filming because there will be a scene that unfolds and then the cameras will stop and we'll all look at each other and we'll go, promos. <laughs> you know, don't you? It's a great feeling. Yeah. Have there been some bad ideas along the way? Have you ever, any that you've gone, we almost did this, glad we didn't? Oh. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it, it's such a fast moving thing. We, we, we have to do so much creatively every day, which is why I still like doing it. You know, like, I mean, three seasons in, you know, and you'd think I might be a bit bored by now, but I'm not like, cause there's so many new creative ideas that we've got to come up with. There are so many things that you get to see every week that contestants do that you've never seen before or never thought of, you know, it's not the same time. Um, and you're working with different people every year, you know, the contestants and their, you know, the ups and downs that they have, you know, being put under the pressure that we do put them under. Um, it, it, it's never boring, but mistakes, um, you know, like, I don't know, you're going to do. Do you know what's really interesting about Julie and, and getting to know Julian is like, there's so much that's out of his control, but then the things that are, he's so across. And it's almost like I, I look at you and I speak to you and I admire the way in which you think, because I know that you are, you're not two or three steps ahead, you're seven and eight. You're such a deep thinker and you're so strategic in how you do it that it, it's been fascinating to watch in my second season, just how much is actually so organic for such a big show to see how much is actually just left to the natural environment but then how you pull it together and, and create and deliver it in such a tight format is, um, it's, it's just incredible to watch. Well, it shocked you when you first stepped on set and you were like, I don't have a script. I think Julius has said, come in and, um, the trust that he puts in his team is admirable. Like any business owner, this is a business, any businessman, businesswoman, business person should take a leaf out of Julian Cress's book. And when you've got the right team, you back him in a hundred percent. Oh yeah, totally. Um, yeah, thanks for that. But I, I, I think that I, I have a, 
an actual interesting chaos theory. Um, and, and I am happy to let things take their own course. Um, because I, I'm, I'm conscious that we're making a reality show and the, the, the less fingerprints that are on it, the better. I think it needs to feel authentic to the audience. So to give you an idea, we don't have many rules. You know, we, we're not like a lot of other shows. We really only tell contestants that we would like them to bathroom on Sunday. We don't tell them they have to, do we? So true. They, 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 they run their own race. The fact that you get to come in and see five bathrooms on a Sunday is a miracle, really, because <laughs> the contestants have put that pressure on themselves. And all that's, that's one of the things that I think makes the show work. It's not Scotty Cam telling them they have to do it. He doesn't care. If they want to go to the pub or play golf or whatever, they can. Um, they, they, they decide what they do every day. They decide when they wake up and when they go to bed. The fact that they do all nighters, that's on them, you know, and I love it. I'm proud that they do, you know, but it's, it's their pressure. It's not our pressure. You know, people say, oh, you, you put too much pressure on these people. I'm like, I don't put any on them. You don't say a word. I don't. If they don't want to finish on Sunday, that's. Well, seen some interesting things this season. <laughs> so, to, okay. It would be obviously stupid not to talk about this connection right here. Can you tell us about when you first saw Marty doing what he did? What caught you? Uh, your attention about him and, of course, what transpired in terms of him coming on as a guest judge last season? Well, I live in Melbourne, so I was obviously Marty for a long time before we met um, because White Fox has such a, uh, you know, a presence um, in the market and I'm a real estate junkie as well. Um, seeing Marty in action... Uh, Harry and Tasha's, um, you know, option, option, uh, you know, up close and personal was probably that first time. Yeah. First time we really got to connect. We'd met at a few car things, yeah. obviously, because we're both car nuts. Yeah. I'll yeah. Get in touch with that. But it was always surface level. Yeah. But I was, you know, extremely impressed. You know, Marty has, um, I think, you know, amazing screen presence. Um, but more importantly, you know, is, um, I've found to just be a pretty straight shooter, you know, when it comes to what you do uh, and how you go about it. I think you're a really interesting thinker. Um, I think that, you know, we're quite simpatico in that, you know, like to mix it up. You know, you don't just, you know, go about anything um, based on precedent and status quo. You know, you're always trying to think, how can I do this a bit differently to engage with people, um, which is kind of what I do. Um, and uh, that's why I rocked up in shorts that first opportunity. Yeah. And it was great. And it's, it's, it's very, you know, it was very memorable, right? For the audience, because every other option is wearing a full suit and tie and you're in shorts, you know? So everybody remembers the guy in the shorts who sold that house. Uh, it's also, you know, you're a supremely confident person. Um, and to, you know, if you want to be memorable, you want to be successful. Because you don't want to be remembered as the guy in shorts who turned up and fucked up the auction, right? Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> who is this vlog? Get some socks on and get back to the office and actually do something. That's right. So I'm, I, you know, I'm proud of you for doing it and knowing that you were going to pull it off. Um, and and so you were memorable in a very positive way. Um, but I I also think that you are somebody who you know who has strong opinions. Um, and they're based on a lot of experience for a young guy. You know, you've seen a lot, um, you know, in market and you've seen enough properties, um, and you and Charlotte have done enough homes more than almost anybody I know in such a short space of time that you've got your hands dirty and that you know what it takes to flip a house. Um, and so when that position became available, I think you were just a very natural choice for it and have proven to just slot it in perfectly. Was there a discussion? Was there like a sit down round table? Here's a few heads. I imagine you had him pretty firmly in your mind from it all. On. It all happened a bit quickly because, um, Neil Whitaker, who I absolutely love and, uh, um, and had been our most senior judge and been on the show for 
a decade. Um, had some issues, personal issues at home um, with his partner, which he's, he's talked about. And it really meant that he needed to, to stay. He just couldn't give up 12, you know, four weekends to fly from rural New South Wales to Victoria to do the judging. Um, and I, you know, totally understood that. And it was a, it was a, a sad moment for all of us, but, um, but you know, the, the network said, well, you know, you know, need someone to step in and, and, and fill that slot. Um, and, uh, and we discussed very brief, briefly with Michael Ely. We only had days really to, to, to come up with an alternative plan because we were about to start filming. Um, and I think the audience, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of what people say, you know, the feedback we get, social media and that kind of thing. And that stuff goes in here somewhere. And I just knew that a lot of people for a long time, uh, you know, had said, well, you know, we need a real estate agent you know, in, in the judging panel. Um, we started with one, our only judge on the block in series one and two was, uh, John McGrath. And we added Neil Whitaker for a design side to the real estate judging in series three. And then we ended up with Neil, Shana, and Darren, who are all very design centric. I think that, I mean, they're all renovators too, and they all, they, they have a sense of the market. Um, but the audience was saying, you know, oh, these guys are you know, just talking about the color of the cushions and we need a real estate agent perspective. Mm. And I agree with it, you know, because that's where we started. Um, so Michael Healy, you know, was very quick, you know, to, to say, yeah, I, you know, let's, let's really go out and try and find someone, uh, who is in real estate. Um, and I said, oh, I know who it is. I just said, I absolutely know who's, who the right person is for the, for the job. It's Marty Fox. And Michael Healy said, that's a guy in the shorts from Harry and Tasha's auction. And I said, yes. He goes, I love that guy. Um, let's see if he'll do it. So uh, I'm going to say, because you just said you had a short space of time between this decision and filming. Yeah. So then you make the call. Mate, tell us, because you tell the story quite funny. I mean, what happened? Well, it, and it, it is quite I don't know how you waited so long, Julie. Because Shira came into the office. This would have been late December. And he said, now I've spoken to Charlotte and I've got it all covered. But we're sending you up to Guingana for a week to rest. Been a tough year. You had your foot on the gas. You cooked. You need to just go away. You're about 10, 14, 15 kilos overweight. Your hair's long and you've got a moustache. And you need to just turn yourself off. And I said, oh, all right, done. When am I going? You're, you're, Marty's very good at one thing, which is acting very quickly. I said, you got to go. He goes, okay. And it was booked within hours. And he was within hours. And the day that I landed in Queensland, which is a health retreat for seven days, amazing. Anyone out there that's tired from work or, you know, it was an amazing group of people, CEOs, people that had lost loved ones, people that were just genuinely tired, people that just needed a shift. It was phenomenal. The day that I landed, I turned my phone off. It was the same day that you sent me the email to catch up. Right. <laughs> so I turned off my social media. I turned off my phone. I mean you know, Zen land for seven days. The car picks me up to then bring me to the airport. I'll never forget. I'm sitting in like just the open area in the terminal and I'm going through, it was 400 and something emails. I'll never forget it. I'm going through, going through, going through, going through. And then I see Julian Cress and it was along the lines of, Hey mate, love to catch up urgently. And it was the day that I checked and I thought, oh my God, Charlotte's always told me to play it cool and I'm never playing it cool. I thought I've played it cool for way too long, no. but what's going on? No. I can't believe he hasn't followed up. Why I follow up? You've sent an email. What did you, what do you think? Do you, was he's ghosting you, Julian? So I, I emailed him back straight away of and said, mate, I've been off grid. And <laughs> I know you're a busy man. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. No, good. And he responds and he says, can I come over and see you ASAP? So I FaceTimed mum and I said, hey mum wants to catch up ASAP. Like, what do you think this is? And mum was like, oh, you must want you to be a part of the show. And I thought, great. I messaged you back and I said, come on over, Charlotte, the kids and, and mum will probably be around. And you said, I'll, I'll bring a bottle of something to drink. What would you like? And I said something French and he goes, I'll bring it from my vineyard. And that was it. 
I assume it wasn't. You didn't get much. The day after. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as he said it to you, you would have been like. So we went out the back. We sat under the, uh, the lucky bean tree, which is the tree that my brother just got married under. Very lucky tree, which I was going to get rid of and it's not going anywhere now. And Jules just told me the story of starting the block and having John McGrath as the first person and, you know, what it did for him and his career and that there was an opportunity that he wanted to present. And I said, I'm all ears. And he said, how would you like to be a guest judge? And I said, I'm in. And he goes, you don't need to think about it. Talk to Charlotte. I said, absolutely. And I went, Charlotte, mum, come down. I'm a judge on the blog. <laughs> and you came in and we sat down in the lounge room, kids running around. It was mayhem. Yeah. And um, it was a beautiful moment and it's burnt in my mind. And it was just a, a real privilege to be asked. There's so many agents in Australia. There's so many people that you'd be exposed to. And to be trusted meant a lot to me. I, I love it when people depend on me for something. Um, particularly in a work environment. And I was just um, so thrilled. But this goes back to your point about Jules. This is one for you. I mean, I've done screen tests, right? I know what it's like to sit there and audition for something. Yes. You just knew. And this is the thing. You're, you've put that faith in him, obviously, because there is quite a difference between going on TV and auctioning a property and actually providing some insightful, articulate judging, mm. which he has to do as a judge in, on this show. It's your baby. Yeah. You just knew. Well, I, I think. You know, finding someone who can be a judge on the block in a, from a casting point of view is probably the hardest job there is. Yeah. Um, very, very few people come to mind, you know, like it, it was, it's a bit scary when you find out that one of the judges can't, you know, make it. Sure. You can kind of fill most other roles. Um, but the other shows that have tried to copy the block or, you know, to make, you know, the networks that have tried to make renovation shows. I know that the biggest struggle they have is not finding contestants, it's finding people. Um, Why is it so hard? Asked? Well, you, you've got to be a very special kind of person. You've got to, you've got to really have the courage of your convictions. You have to be a bit thick skinned, you know, you, you, you can't be too fragile um, because it's not just what you say on the show, but it's all the that everybody's going to say about what you said on the show, um, on social media too. Uh, so you've got to be able to handle that. And, you know, people like Shana Blaze and Darren Palmer, they, they can do it. They, they believe what they say. And it, the most important thing is it has to be real. Right? Yeah. It has to be authentic. Yes. You know, you can't just cast someone who comes in and then says to me off camera, what do you want me to go in and say about this room? You know, that, I don't want that job. Happen. I don't want that job. I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to have that sort of thing. That would come across. It would be shit, right? So I know that I need somebody who can come in and walk into a room and have something to say and believe it and mean it, you know. And, I mean, you would have realized day one, right, when you came in to judge at the end of the day, I said, okay, great. Now, um, what's your scores? You know, I don't tell you. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no thing interference. Out of interference. As you said, fingerprint. Yeah. I don't, I, honestly, I, I don't care who wins each way. Mm -hmm. You know, someone's got to win. I, I just want to know that the three judges who judge the room absolutely believe in their heart that that's the right winner. It's a phenomenal feeling judging because when I finish, uh, you know, people say, oh, you know, how did you go? What did you say? And a lot of the time it's a blur. In the moment, the words are just flowing. It's coming out. I'm receptive to the environment. And it's actually filmed on my day off. It's my rest day. Sundays are typically my family day. It's when I get to recharge and get ready for the week ahead. But what's also interesting is that I'm not a meditator. I don't have quiet time. I'm very ever rarely alone. And people say, oh, you should meditate. When I come to the block and what I experienced last year and in the last three weeks of this season, it is one of the only moments in my week where I actually am in quite a meditative state and I feel like I'm in flow and I'm not being bombarded by staff or problems with my existing business. And it's quite a, um, it's quite a magical time for me because I'm not interrupted. And it's really bizarre because I would have thought prior to starting that it would be really heavy, really taxing on my mind, you know, right? Like just, just hard to do, mm. but I've, I've enjoyed it so much that I, I, I'm sort of in flow mm. and I, I'm sort of just 
I get out of it and it's all a bit of a blur. And then I watch it back, genuinely re reliving what I actually had forgotten. Yes. Well, I, I think it, it, it actually is right in your sweet spot. You know, judging rooms on the block is right in your sweet spot because you get to walk, you appreciate instinctively that these people have put in a huge amount of effort to serve this thing up to you. You're not arrogant about it. You know that they worked hard. You have empathy for what you're judging, which is great. It's something that you share with Shana and Darren, and we would never have a judge that didn't feel that way. Um, but we also want to genuinely give feedback that can help them be better. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's as a property enthusiast and, and a, and a flipper of properties, you actually want them to just take some of this on board to hopefully make more money. Yeah. I've said, I've said it like, I've, I've just read about it at a house. He walks in and Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he walks in and it's like the, the, the things that he notices or picks up or gives you feedback on it. It's it, as you said, it's your natural space. It, it just feels like he comes in and goes, oh, well, you've done the, this and he pick up something like, we've done. And so you're right. I, I thought it was an absolutely natural fit. As soon as you said, and he was on the show, I thought, nah, because, you know, working with Marty for the last few years and having my experience in the media as well, we've had a couple of opportunities come across the desk in real estate television programs that I've encouraged him not to do personally speaking, as I think that they weren't right for his persona, yeah. particularly because they might, they were sort of probably more on the scripted front. He is so good off cuff. I mean, this, this podcast is a great example of that. I don't even tell him what we're going to you know, talk about. He just likes to flow. Mm -hmm. And this just works so well into the expertise and intuition and the articulate nature of his presenting um, made absolutely total sense for this. And it was interesting because I joined a Facebook group of the block 2023 last year just to see what the feedback was on yeah. Marty. And it was really, it was, it was, you know, it was a mix. People were afraid, you know, people get very protective of their show and who's this new guy? Why is he giving such harsh feedback? I, that was the one thing I couldn't understand why people thought he was so harsh. Because mm. to be honest with you, I don't remember you saying one thing that I thought was harsh. No, but then those same people thought that Leah was a bully yeah. because she called a body corporate meeting and asked Stephanie, you know, why her dad didn't get inducted. You know, was not yelling? She, she called a meeting, she asked a question and social media called her a bully. Yeah. That's bullying. I'm like, no, it's not. And they bullied her, which is even more ironic. It's so not. Lit her yeah, I mean, it, yeah, that's, I think it's always hard though in, in season one. And when you do with a, a script, it is always hard to enter. Totally. You're the new guy. You're the, yeah. There's no way that you can come in and give feedback, um, that isn't going to piss people. And I, I stood by the firm, but fair nature of my feedback. I, last I, I will never say anything because I feel like it's, it's what make the show better. I, I'm genuinely saying what's going to make the room better. Oh, and the over, it was over, I should say it was overwhelmingly good. There was people who had, who had a B in their bonnet, but like the people who were good were like, yes, finally to your point, Julian. Yes. A real estate expert. It makes total sense. Fantastic. Um, and of course all the contestants, I mean, it's funny. I bumped into Eliza and Liberty the other day at a winery. I was doing a wedding. They were there randomly doing some influencer stuff and they, they go, oh my God, we just had the funniest thing. We checked into our room and guess what's above the, the bloody sink, a TV. And we were going to message Marty. <laughs> oh, 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 they said that. exactly this thing. That we were. But you know, those guys, they all admitted, oh. they liked you. They, you know, they, they hear the feedback, they get affronted because it's their hard work and Julian, you'd see it. Yeah. But then of course, in the cold, hard light of day, they realize Makes total sense what he says. Yeah. He's got to, you've got to sell this house. Someone's buying it. Yeah. And judging is hard because, um, you've got to pick a winner, you know, and you've got five teams that have worked equally hard to win something. They all believe that. Yeah. Not a popularity contest. It, it, it's, it's a real estate competition. Yeah. And, and also, uh, you know, the audience sometimes doesn't know that, you know, the judges, the judges aren't aware that. This room isn't as good as that room. Yes. Because that contestant's grandfather died on Wednesday, you know, and they had to fly home. Yeah. But the judges don't know that. No. When they're judging the room, because it wouldn't be fair to everybody if I told them. Yep. We go, because then they would be more sympathetic to the course or the grandfather died. Concerns. And then maybe they win the room because it's very hard to be, not be human. Right. So I purposely don't tell Marty that 
aunt's grandfather passed away, you know, and they come in and give harsh criticism of him and a mistake. So I was like, oh, because it's not, oh, this, this room's not up to and it. And of course, people watching are like, very nice, you know, what about this happening and that happening? So they get in trouble for that reason. But I think if people think about it, it's, it's much more, it's much fairer to the contestants across the board and fairer to these guys for me not to tell them yes. that sort of news. Well, last season, I only got to meet the contestants halfway through. Yes. You don't know who these people are. No. No. You don't understand their personalities. You don't understand their relationship. You know nothing. It's the anti-Australian Idol voice theory, which is like, person comes on and, and they say, oh, what's your name, Marty? Um, so why are you here? Oh, my dad died. And then, of course, they get through and you're like, oh, we well, obviously there's some level of, you know. Empathy. Whereas for you, it's just like, you go in and judge what you see. It doesn't matter who's done it, right? Yeah. Um, so it makes total sense. It makes total sense. Are you excited about this season? Which we're off and running and. Yeah, really am. 20? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't have uh, left my family all <laughs> yeah, month to come and live on an island. Uh, and work every day if I wasn't excited about it. Um, but I, I'm really pleased with the way that it's going. It's, it's a, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to resolve from the fact that I'm very proud of the milestone that we've achieved as well. And it, it's very meaningful for all of us on the crew that we're making season 20. And um, there are some people on our crew that have been with us since we started. So, you know, we're all. I feel, I'm feeling some pressure to deliver something special, uh, for the audience. Um, and so far I feel like we're doing that. You know, what do you think, Martin? You've seen that. I mean, the location. I think there's a real nostalgia in the air and particularly for, you know, yourself and your co-founder and David Barber and obviously Juzzy as well, like you three have, um, been there from the very beginning and so many people that have been here, as you said, and almost all living down here, it's almost like it's, it's quite symbolic that you're all together. You've stayed thick for so long. Not many shows get 20 seasons. You've changed the face of what reality TV can be. And to, to be at this point in time is just, I think quite emotional. I, I think you can feel it in the air. Everyone's so proud. Everyone's so supportive and everyone's so excited because this is a resort. It's, two hours out of Melbourne. It's like being on school camp. I love rolling in. It also probably helps that you're next to uh, a Formula One track or not Formula One track, a GP track. You both pour. Oh, we've been, we've been some great drive. I mean, there's two Porsches in the drive. Oh, I bet those are going on a track ladder. <laughs> you bet. Yeah. Well, we'll get heading on the track hopefully uh, yeah. in about a month or so. But we'll find some time, definitely. You can't, can't spend four months here and not, you know, blow out the cobwebs a couple sure. of times. There's something magic in the air for season 20. Okay. And everyone's talking about it. Everyone can feel it. And, um, I'm, I'm so grateful to be a part of it. Yeah. It's very exciting. I mean, look, to be honest with you, we could probably talk for another hour. There's a million other questions that we could talk about, but, um, we've probably got to let him go. Yeah, no, there's, there's actually a lot of the filming and you are the most important person on this set. So, um, Julian, we really, I really appreciate your time. Your time is precious. Um, as I said, I didn't understand, want to understate the fact that you are someone who has changed along with your you know, co-founders and producers, someone who's changed the face of reality television in Australia and the world. I mean, to have that longevity is amazing. Thank you for sparing the time. Thank you for giving our man Marty a platform to do what he does. I think you've, you've created something in pretty special in giving him this, this ability to do what he does and good luck with this season. Who knows what comes next more? Oh, well, yeah, we'll just get a break. <laughs> I was going to say a break in June. We'll get through this one. Just uh, take it a day at a time. Oh, it's exciting. So when, when, when will this air? Just so, so we know when people can tune in and uh, they, they can expect the show to come um, straight after the Olympics. Nice platform. Very good. Lead us in, hey? Provos during the Olympics. Ah, um, big eyeballs. Olympics. Paris. Summer in Paris. Amazing. The show is, yeah. Um, equally, I'm pretty happy that our show will be promoted throughout it. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. All right. Well, thank you very much for being with us. With the Fox podcast. Very special yes. guest. Very special. Of course, you can check it out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and of course, YouTube, Instagram, across our channels as well. Another great one in the books, Marty. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jules. Thanks, Marty. Cheers, Jules. Thanks, Shuey. Nice.